Hi everyone, I'm Susan Nash, AAPG, and we have a real treat today. We have a fantastic webinar. We're continuing on the brine mining. This time we're including um, iodine and also lithium. And not only do we have a focus on the geology as usual, because we are um, a geological society, we are also talking about the technology and the economics. So it's, it's really fantastic. And I'm, I'm really thrilled to be able to introduce our speakers. But before I do so, I'd like to say that this is being sponsored in part by the, our Division of Environmental Geoscientists. And Bert Vogler is our um, president. And I noticed that he signed up for, for this. So I'm like, welcome, Bert. Maybe at the end you can tell it. Give us a few words. And I'd also like to thank our sponsors for the Orphan Wells next week in Pittsburgh. This will be a great show in person. And that will, has a lot to do with brine mining in the sense that some old wells can be converted to brine mines and to brine mining wells. So at any rate, we have Nick Sakato. And for the first time, this is what uh, in probably AAPG history, which was pointed out, we have two Galings on our on our show, our webinar. We have Galen Hewling, and we have Galen Dillowin. And so um, Nick Sakharov is with Reclaimed Minerals. He's an economist. Galen Hewling is with Grounded Energy. He's a geologist, and or uh, Nick is an economist. Galen Hewling is a geologist, and Galen Dillowin of NewTek is a geologist. So welcome, and we'll start with Nick. And by the way, we're recording this so that if you miss some of this or you want to share it with a friend, you will receive a link to the recording. So Nick, if you'd like to share your screen, I'd like to welcome you to the show. Mm -hmm. Yes, I will share it in a minute. So hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Well? Yes. Okay, good. So um, thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for letting me speak. Uh, I'm new to this uh, APG. I was participating once uh, as uh, the listener for one of the seminars and uh, basically that's all. So we are a company that uh, deals with iodine mining. So why I'm here is that because uh, iodine and lithium is mined through the same technology. So let me share a screen, go very quickly with a couple of slides. So I have many, maybe six of them, and I will try to move as fast as possible through it and then get back to the screen where you can see me so that we can have a discussion or um, at least Hold on. Um, hold on. Let me uh, share the screen. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, here we are. Perfect. There okay. we go. Mm -hmm. All right. So um, we are, I'm actually the two companies. The first one is called Iodine Star. Another one is called Reclaimed Minerals. So Iodine Star is more a technology company that is developing a technology to uh, use absorption technology to um, mine or to extract iodine, lithium, bromium, and uh, other uh, critical minerals uh, from the oil, uh, salt water brines. So why iodine? Just a very short, I mean, you guys are geologists, so just a very short why actually iodine is needed at all. So uh, as you can see, 25% is used for the X-ray contrast. Uh, and it's important because uh, we are close to the, uh, finding the solution to the cancer. And uh, this will bring in uh, more proactive um, monitoring, 
which will include more x-rays. So far, it's like reactive. So as soon as uh, doctors have any suspicion that a patient has a cancer, they send him to the x-ray. So uh, there will be more demand for iodine soon, and it's kind of an important. Then um, if you can see on the bottom, this 12%, this is LCD, uh, which are basically any screen that you have now, this TFT screen matrices are used, uh, use one of the layers uh, using iodine and pharmaceuticals. And of course, all the rest. So there's uh, agriculture, animal feed, and everything. Um, let's fast, let's go through this uh, fast. If anybody wants the whole presentation, as you can see, it's just some slides. Um, contact me and I will send it to you. So this is their market overview for their iodine. Uh, the market is growing. The market is growing. Um, the market is growing faster than the supply. Uh, so we had uh, 20 years ago, uh, 20,000 tons. Now we have 35. We had 35. But what happens now is that this um, chili share is shrinking because uh, they are switching the SQM. Basically, probably you know it from the lithium point of view. The SQM is switching from uh, iodine to lithium. Now, uh, why basically? Uh, why Oklahoma? Oklahoma has the best concentration of iodine in brine. So um, this is some kind of a USGS stat that uh, shows that, um, well, Oklahoma kind of a historically has iodine. So the first iodine facilities were, if I remember correctly, 1977. And, uh, and since the, that time, uh, the iodine is mined in Oklahoma. So uh, we tested the water in Oklahoma and Texas. Uh, Texas has, on average, um, about 70% less iodine concentration than Oklahoma. We have not tested in California, but uh, what we see here is that not much of an iodine either. Um, reserves. Uh, why I uh, put in this slide here? Because um, we have the technology, I will be speaking a little bit later on the next slide of it, to uh, get the iodine, not only from uh, the water that is supplied by oil and gas companies, but also the water previously stored in the disposal wells uh, as a flowback. Uh, there is still some tensions and uh, some geologists um, are saying that it's possible to extract it back. Some say that it, it's not. So here is some kind of an input uh, that I'd like to hear if you have your opinion, if it's possible to reverse the um, disposal well and to get the water uh, back out of it without uh, diluting it with the water that is uh, th that was there before. So uh, why it's important? If um, the flowback water could be achieved, this means that we can get a lot of iodine previously disposed. So um, we, uh, I roughly calculated using the database. And it seems that then the US will have about 19 million tons of iodine just in uh, a known to us uh, disposal wells in Oklahoma and Texas. And on average, of course, this is some kind of a, uh, um, it, 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 it's, yeah, it's on average and uh, um, what's the word? Oh my God, the word opposite to liberal. Anyway, 
Uh, so it, it's an important thing that will uh, bring the US uh, to number one in the reserves for iodine. Now let's go to the technology and the same as the business model. Uh, so what we do, we have this uh, adsorption technology. It works quite easily. So uh, we have uh, several columns um, preparing the water. If you see on the left part, uh, the external supplies. So uh, this is where we get the water, the salt water from the oil and gas companies. And uh, in the middle, we also get it from uh, their disposal wells that we reverse to get the water that was previously stored. So first we know um, how much water was there. We know average concentration. So we pretty much know um, how much iodine is in there. The question is if it's possible to get it back using their ESP pumps. And uh, um, when we can do it, uh, we have this water. So we um, preparing it to get the iodine, uh, iodide and um, other stuff out of it. Uh, so we t first of all, we take off all the organics that was uh, in there uh, and uh, separate the iodide from uh, and lithium. So actually iodine, uh, lithium, bromide, uh, something else. So the question is uh, uh, what exactly we will uh, build within this uh, plant. So basically for the lithium, the technology will, will be a little bit reversed because uh, uh, of the positive and negative uh, uh, ions of, of uh, the mineral, but overall the technology will be more or less the same. So uh, our aim is in the end, but this is uh, something that uh, Iodine Star does and we are still researching it. And we think we are about four to five years from it, but uh, in the end we will get the water that we don't need to dispose back, as it's uh, shown here, not in the new disposal well, but we will have uh, the distilled water that we can use. So this will this will revolutionize the whole industry in terms of uh, of the salt water. We will have the fresh water, the potable water, and uh, hopefully the distilled water that could be used. Uh, I will show you where we are thinking we could use it. But overall, the iodine, um, lithium uh, in, in an oxide and uh, uh, bromine goes to the market as a bulk, uh, uh, as a trading, uh, as, a, as a trading mineral. Now, yeah, it's the last slide. Uh, why I wanted to show you here is that if you can see in purple, there is the cost of brine. So it's actually uh, what our uh, production uh, consists of uh, monitoring wise. So the brine, utility power and chemicals. This is where we are trying to, uh, to manipulate uh, uh, with our research. Uh, we don't know what exactly to do with the chemicals. I mean, we are working on that, but uh, probably the cost will remain the same. But however, about the cost of brine and the cost of utility, this is where we are trying to lower it down. And the same thing will go with iodine and with lithium. So um, one of the solutions will be if we have the water, we will uh, use it to get uh, out of it uh, the um, hydrogen and then use the hydrogen to power the facility. So uh, in the end, our plan is to have uh, a completely um, environmental neutral 
facility that will rely on uh, the electricity produced by itself. Uh, and uh, it, it will be kind of a black box uh, without any inputs and only outputs. But this is something that probably we are about five years out of it. Um, that's pretty much with the presentation. Let me stop sharing the screen so that I can see you and you can see me. Thank and you. I can see my, and I can see myself. Um, hold on. Yeah. Um, so this is a, a kind of a short, short presentation uh, about uh, the iodine in, in Oklahoma. So if you have any questions, I would definitely like to discuss it. If you have any inputs, uh, I will be also glad to, 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 to hear it. And, and I'm also at your service with the discussion. And uh, thank you so much for hearing, for listening to me. Um, let's have a coffee and let's probably head to the next, uh, to, 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 the, to the first gallon. <laughs> thank right? you. That's great. Well, mm -hmm. really appreciate that. And there's a question that is asking if we will share presentations. And the answer is, um, these presentations are going to be shared as a video, but the um, the PowerPoints or the PDFs are the owners or their their intellectual property of the presenters. So please contact them directly. Uh, can I have a question? Um, no, we'll have to wait till well. Let's wait till the end because we want to make sure that there our Galen's have a chance to um, <laughs> to to talk. So thank you, Herman, for your patience. So our next one is is. Um, Galen Hewling, so welcome. Right. And you can please put your question in the Q and A too. So my name is Galen Hewling. Uh, I'm a geologist. I spent a majority of my career thus far with in the oil and gas industry. I started with uh, a small, a really small company in Utah, and then. Um, when I went to do my master's in, at TCU, got picked up by XTO Energy, which was owned by Exxon. In my last couple of years there, I got interested in lithium. Um, and then with COVID happening, I uh, was laid off from there and then got, got a contract with Standard Lithium and mapping a smack over. And I've been in lithium ever since. Um, I saw some of, some people in the chat are are familiar with the work uh, we did together with them. So uh, today I'm going to be discussing just generally the smack over lithium brines and why I think they're a key uh, lithium source for domestic battery production going forward. Uh, so as, as we can see, there's no shortage of necessary you know lithium in brines in the US there's lithiums all the way from Appalachia to Williston Powder River all the way out to Salton Sea in California and then obviously down in the smack over in Arkansas Texas Louisiana Mississippi um, and there's, there's a smattering of brines elsewhere in the country as well uh, they range from geothermal environments to arid closed basins with high evaporation to shallow and deep oil fields. So there's wide variety of scenarios, wide variety of geology, but I'm going to talk a little bit about what majority of them have in common. How do they, how do the brines get there and what's the original source for the lithium? Uh, the original source of the lithium ultimately is, is, volcanic rock it's you know these uh granitic intrusions often there's uh, tectonically driven subsidence that creates a, a closed basin um that that creates your original source rock then these rocks are subsequently weathered and um accumulated in this closed arid basin where you have high evaporation uh, we see this modernly in a modern day environment in Nevada and um, this, as well as the high 
Andes and South America, where a lot of the current lithium is being produced from the, that lithium triangle. Um, also, you need sufficient time to accumulate these brines. It's not just a, an overnight or, or a couple thousand years. You need millions of years you typically to accumulate these brines. Um, that's not the only way they accumulate, that you can also have basement fluids, hydrothermal fluids, bringing uh, the lithium up to the surface and then it uh, being accumulated into a, a sufficient reservoir there. Um, there. We've seen some other ways that it's it's been brought into basins through volcanic tufts, uh, volcanic ash being brought into a basin. But ultimately, most of these brines that I've that I've been able to come in contact with are have this closed basin, uh, tectonically driven subsidence with long long times to accumulate the water and and high evapor high evaporation rates. Whether that's current or that happened a long you know millions and millions of years ago. And then it was buried and, and put in place. The smack over uh, is a very large formation. It, it goes all the way across the Gulf of Mexico, all the way from uh, Mexico itself through Texas, Louisiana, all the way over to Florida. Um, it's the upper Jurassic. And the primary reservoir is the upper, Ren upper Reynolds member. That's where most of your porosity and permeability are. That's also where most of your oil and gas fields are. The Reynolds member is composed mostly of oids and non-skeletal carbonates. Um, the average reservoir, not, not just formation, but good reservoir porosity is anywhere from nine to 13%. I've seen it getting up to upwards of 20% at times, but your general average porosity is in that nine to 13% range. Um, your gross thickness is, is anywhere from 200 to 500 feet thick. And the depth to reservoir is anywhere from, from 6,000 feet in the shallow portions in, in you know, northern Texas, southern Arkansas. But it can get down as deep as, as 15,000 feet, the, these big faulted salt basins. So apart from, from just the Reynolds member, there's a top seal above that, which has set up a lot of the plays for, for your oil and gas um, production. That top seal of the Buckner and Hydrite is also a potential source for lithium. Um, I think one of the main sources is the Luan salt, which has been my, my main going theory up till recently, but I think there's also potential for for a contribution from that Buckner uh, on top of it. So again, going back to the early Gulf of Mexico, we had um, and more more in Druckmann in 1981 made a, a good um, animation or or chart of how you might have had this brine invasion from the Luan into the smack over. So we had the early Gulf of Mexico rifting and exposure of basement salts or basement rock. And then you had the deposition of the Luan salt, which is you had a long periods of high evaporation and, and time to concentrate uh, those fluids that were eroding from either basement faults or, or other mountains up to the north in, in Arkansas or what, you know, modern day Arkansas. Then we had a time of unconformity and a relative sea level rise and flooding. And then we had the deposition of the smack over. Um, during this burial, we had continued um, faulting, which would have allowed further pathways for that Luan salt brine to come up into the smack over. Now, one of one of the reasons I think the Luan is is a primary contributor to, to the smack over lithium brines is that it's the the Luan is all throughout the Gulf of Mexico. It 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 would have had enough time and thickness 
the and available lithium to see the co high concentrations we have in this Mac over today. Um, I don't know if the Buckner anhydrite had enough thickness and, and time to accumulate the the amount of lithium we see within this Mac over. Uh, that's one thing I'm I'm continuing currently to to investigate is you know is would the volume in the of brine in the Buckner have been enough to supply what the the volume of lithium we see in the the smack over today. Because we we see it we see lithium in the smack over not just in Arkansas, even though that's where most of the focus is today, uh, due to standard lithium and Exxon and, and Albemarle. We see it all the way into Texas. We see it all the way into Mississippi, Alabama, uh, all the way down, you know, even even to Austin at times in the smack over. Uh, and as far as how, how this back over compares to other lithium brines in the world and in the country. The Salton Sea is generally averaged 211 parts per million. Um, Clayton Valley is 150 to 320. And as we see here on this map, we have regions of the smack over that are well above that, that are three to 400 um, parts per million. Easy. Standard lithium recently drilled a couple wells just across the Texas Arkansas border that's up to 600 parts per million. So it's it's easily, as far as brines go, world class concentrations. And one of the reasons Arkansas has been more prolific is generally it's a thicker. The rock formation, the good reservoir is thicker in Arkansas generally than than elsewhere along the trend. Not that you can't couldn't have sufficient deposits, thicknesses in say Texas or or elsewhere, but that's one of the thickest regions, best porosity and permeability. Now I just added this slide uh just this morning uh, because I typically get these questions of, okay, is is there a trend with say H2S and lithium? So I took uh, data from an AAPG bulletin article um, from Molivani and Walter in 1992 and just graphed the data they had in there. Uh, here in this, this, this graph um, in the upper right, we see the H, I plotted the H2S versus lithium. There is a correlation, but it's, you know, there's a pretty wide variation. Um, you could you could have some relatively low H2S and still have some high lithium concentrations, but there is a trend. I don't think it's necessarily causal. I don't think uh, because you have H2S, you have high lithium. I just think generally where you have higher total dissolved solids, you're going to have higher lithium as we see in this first graph you know as you your total dissolved solids go up your lithium also goes up um, another big question is you know is is the bromine or bromide correlative with lithium uh concentrations i would say generally yes but again that might just go back to that total dissolved solids um there's, I don't, I don't know that there's one, you know, mineral you can point to as a, if you have this present in this concentration, you're going to have this concentration of um, lithium. One, one thing I plotted that was interesting, and this, this, I'm not going to go too much into this today, but it has to do with the dolomite forming process. This calcium to to magnesium ratio to lithium it seems to give a pretty strong correlation. So that, that was something interesting I, I came across. Um, I'm not a geochemist, so I, I'm not gonna be able to go into all the, the reactions that, that go into that, but it is a good correlation that I've found recently. So why, why, does, all, why does it matter, you know, as uh, the, 
economist, you know, that just presented would would tell you like it's all going to go back to the money. It's all going to what what value can we derive from it? It's good to know the geology, but um, so I just threw some hypothetical numbers together. If you generally had a say 100 feet thick reservoir in the smack over uh, and a standard section of 640 acres at 11 percent porosity and 250 parts per million lithium um, at $25,000 per metric ton, which is a little little high to today's standards, but um, hypothetically, you, that would generate, that would be $290 million per section of lithium carbonate uh, in place. Now, what your recovery factors are gonna be, we don't know, no one's producing it at scale yet, We're, you know, that's still to be found. But those are good starting numbers, you know, the equation you would use to calculate that roughly. So the smack over has more than just a good resource going for it. It's an area that's favorable to industry development. Uh, Texas, Arkansas, Louisiana, all those have a strong history of oil and gas development. They have that oil and gas infrastructure in place to be able and and the jobs in place to be able to work on all those facilities. And it has near access to a lot of where the, the auto manufacturers are gonna be located with all their battery manufacturing plants. Um, it also has easy access to the Gulf of Mexico, to, the, to global markets. So that's, for all those reasons, the source, location, uh, timing of the market, I think that's why this backover is gonna be an important resource going forward. Um, that's all I have for today, thank you. Thank you. That was great. Wonderful details. And it's a perfect segue to the second Galen, Galen Dillowin of New Tech. It helps if I unmute. <laughs> Welcome. Well, thank you. Um, so, yes, uh, I did want to correct one thing right quick that Susan said is I am not a geologist. I'm an engineer, actually. Uh, not that I take a higher stance, it's the fact that I would be easily outclassed by most people on this phone call in the geology department. So uh, my name is Galen Dillowin. I've been working for New Tech for almost 15 years. Um, we are, we specialize in subsurface characterization. Uh, many people on this call have recognized several of the names that have popped in here know us as the people with the pretty logs. We do a lot of petrophysical analysis, do a lot of core analysis, and of course, completion engineering, geological modeling and reservoir engineering. All of these kind of play into this discussion uh, for uh, what we need to do to uh, get further along this question. Again, for us, it's telling one question using all of these disciplines, or not telling one question, telling one answer to the questions and looking at it and integrating it. Because if the answers diverge from the different groups, then the we don't have a good understanding of what the story is. The area of interest, this is Southern Arkansas. This is just purely looking at the new tech database uh, coming across the three county area from Standard Lithium and where Exxon is looking at. This is the smack over trend that uh, Galen Hewling was showing you uh, coming through here. Looking at the data, uh, these are four wells. Each, the three wells on the left have triple combo data with the one immediately to the westmost uh, being a quad combo and the one on the right being just a resistivity sonic gamma ray. And what we see is one thing that uh, anyone that's played enough time in the oil and gas sector is we can find water. And that's what we need to do when we're looking for lithium. We need to find the sources of these water. Uh, looking at this upper member that Galen Hewling talked about, you can see it clearly across this three county area. Doesn't mean that it's good everywhere. The one on the right, the well on the right here, you can see that the uh, Buckner actually has more water sitting into it, which was going to be one of my points, and we didn't coordinate this at all. Uh, looking at the fact that there may be a source in there for that also. But if you look in it, the smack over in this case is just plain tight. There's just not a lot of information there. But we have 
water upon water, right? When we used to drill these wells, uh, the common phrase was watch out for the ocean, right? Question is how much can we get into? When we start looking in these areas of these plants and such, and we start looking at these uh, volumes in uh, cubic kilometers, right? That these are huge numbers with porosities above 10%. And this is all taken from their uh, presentation. Uh, the concentrations, anywhere from 400 down to 150, 160. Taking that into and calculating it across to actual tons, we're seeing, and some of this had to be scrubbed out, is we're seeing upwards of uh, 30 tons per acre. Uh, those, these are huge numbers. What is some of the data that we need when we start looking at this? You have to have an absolute strong geological understanding of the deposition. Where is it coming from? Where are we looking at that basement rock? Um, one thing that's nice about this area is we do have data. Not all these areas have data. You know, when we're looking for areas that have water, you know, in the industry of oil and gas previously, uh, we stayed away from water. We didn't want that. So looking in areas that may not have the greatest well density out there to look at. Papers, there's huge amounts of papers out there over the years. And starting to dig into some of the uh, more obscure um, theses out there uh, starts coming into, into play, uh, making, looking at the maps, looking at different water samples. This is an example of, uh, of a project we worked up in the panhandle. You can see a clear delineation of wells. Where are oil and gas wells? Well, you see all the dots. Where are they not? Uh, in the middle here. Uh, so when we look at these different structures, when we look at it, we've got the ability to make huge cross sections across there and looking at the different intervals. Because even when you take something as simple as gamma rays to be able to delineate thicknesses and a bit of sand quality, you know, you're going back to some simple uh, petrophysics, not extremely advanced things at this particular point. Where do we look at? Where do we see continuous components? When you start looking into quality, you know, porosity, calculating these out, these are big numbers in these sand developments that get to be 30% porosity full of water, um, as well as having fractures, as well as having not just uh, lateral continuity, but vertical uh, communication. And when we start looking down, that's what we want. We want to touch things like the granite uh, and look at the areas where we have huge influx. Where do we have traps? Where do we have seals? These are all important questions when we start looking at these individual flow units, because a flow unit ultimately is where we start uh, understanding where this water is transferred to. Looking at this in a 3D space and understanding how these uh, flow, it's not too much different than looking at an oil and gas reservoir, wanting to understand traps, wanting to understand uh, seals wanting to understand uh, thicknesses. It all comes into play and there are critical numbers to those because if you're not thick enough, you still don't have enough water being produced. You don't have enough water being produced. It doesn't contain the lithium because the lithium didn't leach into it. So as you go through and understand what these are coming across these different formations, we can look at that. Again, no different than oil and gas. When you come in and look, start looking at things, porosity is king. If you have to have porosity, the big difference here is we're looking for high water saturation uh, porosity. It's no longer looking for the low saturations. Um, and we can look at an awful lot of that looking at uh, the older data sets that exist out there. Uh, here you go. Here's water saturation looking. We were looking for zones that were in excess of 80% water saturation. Um, and so when we're looking at these, we found numerous sands coming across. And our definition, obviously, in net to gross changes. But this can all be mapped out using existing uh, skills that most geologists have. When we start looking at the cross sections and looking at it, sorry, I have to blur some of this out. Um, you can see the symbols where we had uh, wells with logs. 
And also you can start seeing the black symbols in the background, which is where we had lithium concentrations. Getting those water samples is critical for understanding. Uh, we'd love for uh, USGS to release an update of those lithium numbers and concentrations to be able to do it, but it's going to take people doing that type of work, whether it's universities, whether it's grants, whether it's just individuals going out there um, to look at it. Here are some, just a cross section, north, south, uh, going across to see the different formations. Uh, huge amounts of data, and these are thick, thick intervals. Each one of these uh, spaces here is 200 feet. So when you start looking at these and the complexity of it, you've got seals, you've got things coming in. This is another north-south one. Um, with different pinch outs, understanding how that all comes together. And then once you have those concentrations and those values, you can start tying these in. Uh, as any engineer should tell you is everything should be done statistically, not with a 100% assertion of this is what it is. So looking at different probabilities of the concentrations of lithium from the different samples, we came up in this case of uh, a P10, P50, and P90 case of lithium coming across, converted it to tons, and then back to uh, tons per acre. Seeing numbers as high as in the 60s and as low as in the single digits. So you can absolutely see what they're looking at coming across this area. Um, again, this was another formation looking at it and concentrations all over the place. And this is all calculations. Here's one that is the was the basis for a lot of this work. We saw concentrate or tonnage here in the P90 case of 182 tons per acre. If you take that all the way out to uh, the PT, P10 case, that's 760 tons per acre. These are huge amounts. So being able to figure out this, these numbers and actively quantify it and sum it up. Um, Again, you're looking at the ability to have more production out of old water-filled reservoirs than is currently coming out of China and Argentina. And yes, I am aware of what those kind of numbers are saying out there. But if we could start replacing that with stuff we're already producing, and coming up with technology through that, it will change the way that we can look at lithium and reduce our foreign dependency on it. Again. What other steps would you need to do? Obviously, everything at this point is going to be compared to against uh, standards smack over uh, project. Looking at uh, you know accuracy of these, some of these well sets are very old. You have to put some error bars on it. Um, I wouldn't go through and tell you to do it, but if you have an idea of an area, get a good set of data to look for it four wells per county, four counties at most looking at it, uh, looking at different water samples of different counties for this particular project. Um, what is your land lease availability out there? If it's already leased up, can you do anything with it? And then getting it all to 3D sizes, which is something we can all do. With that, I'm gonna turn this back over to Susan. Thank you. Yeah, this is amazing. And I just want to thank you for excellent presentations by everyone. And I'm going to put, turn my camera on. And we have a number of questions. So let me pull up the Q&A, wherever it is now, it hid itself. And uh, um, I'll start with a few questions in the chat. What is the cost basis for the cost of brine? Is that per barrel? I, I went, I'm thinking that yeah. it's probably, yeah, go uh, ahead. Susan, actually, I already answered some of the, some of the questions. Oh, so okay, if you good. can see there is, yes, there are some replies. I didn't realize that it's for the further discussion. I thought it's just a kind of a question. Oh, no, that's fine. That's good. Mm -hmm. So um, are you using geostatistics to help the, in, understand the variability? I guess that was probably for the Galens. Yes, absolutely we are. 
uh, it, it has to be applied when you start modeling over such large areas, uh, just due to the nature of uh, implying depositions and extreme, most of the time extreme gaps in data. That's good. Um, so does, uh, let's see, Q&A. Uh, are you uh, running economics on Swanson's P-mean case? I don't know. I guess nobody has an answer. <laughs> okay, so um, John Price is asking, what spacing between wells is needed to determine reserves? I'm assuming that that's, that is um, applying to lithium and the reserves in, in lithium. I think it also applies, it depends on the rock quality you're looking at. If you're looking at rocks that have a 30 PU average porosity coming through it, you're gonna have much larger drainage radius, radii than anything else. And that would take a, uh, an engineering approach. It's a very quick uh, determination, but it really, I mean, the rock is gonna dictate that space and just like it should in any resource. Excellent. Um, I noticed that Stephen Getz is here and he's written uh, and made wonderful presentations on the smack over. So he has a question. So um, Steve, I'd like to invite you to unmute and ask your question. You can turn on your camera. And then also Hermann um, Levitt had a question earlier too. So I'd like to um, invite him to participate. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, my question is regarding the smack over is, uh, how many how many barrels per day would you have to produce to economically produce and separate the uh, lithium? Are you dealing with a carbonate reservoir? And to me, uh, I wonder just how many barrels a day you'd have to get out of that to 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 be commercial. When you start flowing wells at very high flow rates, especially if they have any kind of CO two or any kind of uh, caustic material within the uh, formation itself, it could cause problems. So that's my main question. Yeah, you're going to want you're 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 going to need to flow several tens of thousands of gallons or barrels per day, um, probably maybe per well, maybe up maybe up to a hundred thousand. I forget, I'm 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 forgetting which one which one it was seven hundred thousand gallons I think per day. So you're you're going to want several maybe seven or so wells producing. You know, fifteen thousand gallons per day. So, you, the in general, you're going to want to drill new, just brine production wells, not just rely on on the oil and gas wells to produce this water. Um, those kinds of flows you don't usually get from uh, oil and gas wells at at the pressures from the smack over. Uh, that's basically the answer to my question, uh, because I worry about the caustic effect of what you get at that depth. I knew you couldn't use regular oil and gas. You can't re-enter oil and gas wells to do this. One would have to go to chromium pipe, which would push up the price. Mm. But uh, that was my real question. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, un unless you're using, you know, a, a, a lot of, you know, several more uh, oil and gas wells than you do you know, per production well or vice versa, you know, it's, it's but generally the, the, that size and diameter of a oil and gas well aren't going to be enough to to do to to make it economic. Can I make a comment on that quickly? Sure. Okay, so we calculate about hundred thousand barrels a day, which produces on an efficiency of about twelve percent of extraction. I think we think about. Oh, hang on. Um, just to say, I was, welcome. I was just going to call on you. Would you introduce yourself? And, uh... Oh yeah, my name okay. is Herman Levitt, Alma Energy, and. Um, so we are calculating a flow rate of 100,000 barrels a day to produce yeah. 45 tons of lithium carbonate equivalent. Yeah. Uh, and that is about, <clears throat> and that's in the range of the efficiencies what you have out there on the extraction efficiency. Um, 
And we think that most of the wells, good performing wells are may flow 10 hours in the day. So you have to have a cluster of wells in order to produce that amount of uh, fluid per day. That's what, what we are usually using here. Just to let you know. Yeah, no, yeah, yeah. I was I couldn't remember which one it was if it was gallons or barrels. And so yeah, hundred thousand barrels sounds about right. Well, one of the problems you're gonna have when you're dealing with uh, that kind of flow rates. You have to have very big case in a TD. You're not going to do this through a, a four or seven inch hole. You're going to probably go to no. nine and three quarters or so at yeah. the bottom hole, which means it's that's a very, very uh, strong surface casing. Mm -hmm. And also, you have a problem of you've got brine that's coming out of there. Where are you going to put the brine? Probably re it. Where do you re it? There's, there's issues here where you start dealing with carbon. Yep. That's all I want to say. I, I agree with you. You know, somebody mentioned the corrosiveness of the, of the brine. So, that drives your costs up. Um, I think uh, re repurposing an old well is always a high risk issue uh, by all means. And so our solution is drilling a twin. Excellent point. So we have a, a question from David Leary. He says like, like all continuous resource plays, there will be sweet spots. What controls matter most? And how does one predict ahead of the bit. So I guess, you know, the higher concentrations, pockets of higher concentrations. I mean, it seems to me, so, I, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. I, I would, I would think it's, so your, your higher concentration matters to a point, but it's sort of a diminishing returns because all your other the, the goal is to get your brine, your lithium brine, up to a certain concentration. After that, all your other operational inputs and expenses are still going to be the same. You know, getting that original concentration, you know, resource is certainly a factor, but I think most of your, most of the issues and, and sweet spots are going to come operationally, really. Uh, yeah. Nick has his um, hand up. Maybe he's um, has a response to it too. Thank you, Galen. That was good. Uh, yes, let me add a little bit. Uh, I agree with uh, Galen, but uh, just a little bit from the economist's point of view, right? So here we have a kind of an equation where, um, I mean, we have the goal, and the goal is always to get the money, to be economically efficient. So, uh, there is three different um, parts of this equation. The technology, what we can do, the efficiency of extraction, the concentration, and this is just one of it. It's important, yes, I understand that, but, and the third one uh, is the volumes. So the sweet spots, this is what I found out that we know the, in iodine business, we know the sweet spots, there is huge concentration of iodine. The problem is that there is no volumes for that. And when you go back from the sweet spots to the average that you need for production, this is when you say, hey, we don't need actually the sweet spots. We need the volumes, we need the efficiency to extract, and we need the uh, stability of the supply. Mm -hmm. So this is more important in, in here than to yeah. have some kind of a concentration. Right. I hope this adds a little bit. Mm -hmm. there, there was yeah. a a question on that end because uh, Galen, you showed these nice things what you put this morning on the on the chemical composition, mm -hmm. and uh, so that is impacting the efficiency because you so, you showed a nice plot of magnesium and potassium, yeah, and processing your lithium and that was also a question for Nick. So what is an efficient process actually in order to recover the lithium? out of the brine. And that's a, a big issue here, which actually, I have seen a couple of companies who are experimenting with that and they have huge problems because the brine chemistry is not perfectly suitable for extraction of the technology. So, and that was my question also on Nick, because he says he's doing a successfully iodine extraction, which is fine, but that's a completely different chemical element with a completely different valence and chemical character than lithium. Lithium is number three in the in the chemical period table and it's a pretty aggressive body. 
So the question is how you tackle these kind of things. That's an economic issue, isn't it? Uh, let me then start probably. So, uh, uh, yes, actually, uh, of course, we look at their, uh, all the elements that are in the water and uh, um, we see, we are mostly um, afraid of, uh, again, I'm an economist, right? So I'm not an engineer. So we have engineering group and we have a chemical, separate chemical engineering. So, uh, but what I understood of what they said was that um, we are looking uh, not only at the iodine concentration, I'm not talking about lithium now because lithium is something that we are not doing so far. We know that this technology, with this technology we can do this, but uh, on the market side, uh, iodine is uh, more profitable. So we are stick to, to the iodine. Uh, anyway, um, answering your question, um, this is based on the technology. So with the technology, we are extracting everything out of the water. This is why we want to have in the end uh, distilled water. We will take out everything, including the magnesium. Um, how this is done? Well, um, the iodine is also quite aggressive uh, element. So we are using the titanium equipment so that it can, uh, it's not um, eaten by the iodine. Um, so not sure if it asks, if, if, if I'm a good person to answer your question because it's more like, ask me about the money. And that's good. Well, I've got, we've got time for a few more. Um, we have, a, Aaron Ball has a question for Galen Hewling. Have you looked into the reason for the parabolic trend in your bromine versus lithium? How does bromine concentration decrease with increased lithium concentration? So I haven't looked into any of these reasons behind these ratios. Uh, I, again, I, I just made these plots this morning because I had been getting, every time I went to a conference or something, people tended to ask about that. So I, I threw that up this morning. This this data comes from from different regions within this macover, so there may be uh, it'd be interesting to see where the different regions plot with on within that bromine versus lithium uh, plot to see if different areas contribute to that that parabolic shape. Yes, yeah, so I'm I'm not sure what causes that. Excellent, and then Patrick Dobson has a question that. It's kind of like a decline curve for lithium. Are you modeling how the lithium concentration in the brines will decrease with time as the lithium poor brine is reinjected back into the reservoir and how this will impact lithium recovery over time? I know that is being modeled. I, I haven't done that modeling myself, but I know of the people that I've spoken with, that it certainly is a, a concern and issue and, and part of the modeling process. I know standard lithium has um, included that in some of their models. I know um, some of my contact, top contacts at ExxonMobil, they've been looking into that as well. So I, that's certainly on people's radar for sure. I don't, I don't know, I don't know the decline curve. I don't know the ratio because no, no one's actually done it yet to, <laughs> It's no one's actually doing it. Yeah, it's a fascinating co concept. And, and um, yeah, maybe Herman is, is doing a little bit of that. Don't know. Or I noticed Brent Wilson is on the call. If, if Brent would like to chime in, that would be cool. Yeah, so, so on, yeah, on, on, on the ratio or on the, on the TDS, it's a pretty critical thing. At the end of the day, um, the biggest issue is actually when you process your, you have to look at at, at uh, a sodium to lithium ratio because the sodium is a bad guy in the game and it's very heavy. The concentration is four or five magnitudes higher than that of lithium and how to separate that at the end of the day is really, really a challenge. 
and this is where most of the um, uh, production processes are failing at the end of the day. <clears throat> They're working very nice in the lab, but when you put a natural brine out, which is hypersaline, you, you have really a big challenge. And on, on top of it, corrosion. And that's the thing. So that's basically what I have to say to it. Thank you. That's good. Um, okay, so Patrick Dobson has another question. Pretty interesting. Bromide has been commercially recovered from smackover brines for decades. What lessons from this can be applied to recovering lithium from smackover brines? I guess is that that's for me. I guess. Um, <laughs> yes, I guess so. I mean, whoever wants to answer it. I mean, I I, I would assume there's uh, several learnings about injection. You know, there we can see the injection rates and uh, pressure profiles from the production and injection wells in the area, and so I. Though that would be able to feed into the modeling. Um, that's just a, off the top of my head. Um, you know, standard lithium has the benefit of tacking on to the end of their the, the bromine plant. And so, you know, they get those benefits, but I, I don't know if they're going to be able to, you're going to be able to achieve the same results elsewhere as you you know expand to different plants along the trend you know, it's, it's just going to vary vary to area but i know yeah. along I, I agree and i think i think that there's a lot to be said for throughput and sequence in the the, the whole process or the chemical process and so i'm i'm sure i've been doing a little bit of reading about this and and please chime in anybody in the audience who's who's um has experience, but what um, people have written about is just the the fact that you you really have to um, plan the production, the the flow, the throughput, the flow, and have an, a sense of of your filters and your output and the and the the correct temperatures. Just the whole chemical processing um, is is really affected by that, and so there would be a lot of lessons learned. Um, like what sequences to not do and what temperatures to not have and, and those types of things. Um, Susan, uh, this yes. is Nate Byers with uh, Longquist. Uh -huh. um, I'm not sure how to raise my hand, so I'm just kind of cutting. <laughs> no, great. Yeah, welcome. Um, we have done quite a bit of modeling uh, on a, for a few different clients on uh, production of smack over brines. Mm-hmm in in a few different states and uh we do this all through dynamic modeling uh using a geocellular static model mm -hmm. and um we we produce decline curves um that show the uh decline in the uh the minerals that we're targeting uh one of those being lithium um from and this is caused by the injection of the spent brine a certain distance away from the brine supply wells and uh, what you end up seeing uh, typically um, is what we refer to as the breakthrough time um, in years uh, where that spent brine is going, that spent brine front is going to reach the supply wells. And then you start to see a gradual decline. It, it has uh, a linear um, slope. Um, and it, it'll be something like, you know, 3% to 7% decline per year, um, typically. Um, and, and that'll continue to be seen throughout the life of the project, that decline. Um, over multiple decades, you may actually reach an asymptote and that decline starts to level out. Um, and that occurs when your spent brine front um, is basically uh, feeding 100% one side of your supply wells, but on the other side, you're pulling from fresh reservoir brine. And so there is kind of an asymptote that's reached after a certain period of time. Um, but whether or not that well is still economic at that at that point uh, just depends on um, um, the, the project and various other components. But um, 
Oh, very useful. Yeah, and we, we've done a lot of modeling. It, it, the decline really depends on the distance between your supply wells and, and your uh, reinjection wells. Yeah. Uh, Steve, you have your hand up. Did you have a comment or el elaboration? Uh, I, yeah, I do. If I can get myself up. When you start producing at 100,000 barrels a day, it gets to be problematical. A lot of pressure on the system. I mean, how many people know somebody that's an engineer that's dealt with 100,000 barrels a day production? It's not impossible. It's problematic. I know one such man. I've been in the industry, the oil and gas industry, for, what, 50 years? But here's where it comes down to knowing people. So before you start all this, make sure you know what you're getting into. That's all I'm trying to tell you. It's not possible, it's problematic, but be aware of that. Yes. I, okay. And that 100,000 barrels per day figure, uh, that can't possibly be uh, a single well. Oh. Uh, I, right. I think that's an array of wells. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's for sure. Just a small comment. I throw a wrench in here. Uh, in California, in Salt and Sea, they want to produce 1.7 million barrels a day. <laughs> wow. Yeah. When you take put the numbers together and the production, this is what they are actually holding. That's cool. Okay, so we have time for one or two more uh, quick questions and quick answers. Are there any fully functional lithium extraction plants processing brine out of produced water and recovering lithium? Oh, I think you just mentioned the salt and sea, but that's not really an oil, converted oil and gas well. But, and and even they aren't at you know full production. They're they're still yeah they're still not at scale yet. To my then, yeah, and then finally, um, I wonder if calcium calcite can coal, hold in whole lithium in solid solution. Hmm. And greater than dolomite, so that dolomitization would release lithium. Well, and then he Brian goes on. Strontium acts like that when aragonite recrystallizes to calcite. I can I see strontianite in the Highland Quarry in Arkansas in that setting, for instance. Hmm, that's interesting. I guess we we're talking about time. How much time would be required? Geological time or <laughs> Oh. And someone was asking earlier about the my uh, potassium to magnesium and lithium plot. Um, the reason I had plotted that was often you have you get a concentration of in, if you have a, a lithium brine concentration, say in a solar, often you'll get potassium and magnesium concentrated in there as well with your, your other metals. Um, and so if if that was the case and it was coming from the Buckner anhydrite, I was looking at the levels uh, you know, to see what that might have, what how that ratio affects the smack over brine. So if it were coming from the Buckner anhydrite and causing, and then that magnesium causing dolomitization within the within the smack over. And so I was, uh, that's why I had that graph in there. So I was just kind of looking at those calcium magnesium ratios or potassium magnesium ratios as they might've affected the dolomitization rates in that upper smack over. Interesting. Yeah, there's a lot. I mean, a lot of, of this that really requires some very creative thinking about geochemistry. So wonderful. Well, we're out of time. So I know that people have more questions, but I, I would encourage everyone to reach out directly to our presenters and I will um, share their information and, and contact information so that you can. And want to just say thank you to, um, to Nick and Galen and Galen. <laughs> And this, this is just wonderful. And, and if, if you have any final thoughts, and I also would like to thank um, the Division of uh, Environmental Geoscience. I noticed that mm -hmm. Bert Vogler 
had uh, registered, so I hope he's here. And just any final thoughts uh, from Nick and, and the Galens? So, uh, colleagues, thank you very much. That was an interesting discussion, especially for me. I mean, you know, when you are out of this club, you are like, uh, usually when I'm on their meetings with economists, I'm like, okay, fine, knew that. Yeah, 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 tell this. I knew that. Okay, Captain Obvious. Here is a different story. Everything that you tell is so new to me. It's so energizing. Thank you so much. And uh, uh, the last one, Susan, thank you so much for hosting this. Uh, this is really appreciated. Oh, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Hi, this is Bert with uh, the DEG. Um, I have been on the call and listening, and I want to thank our three speakers. Uh, DEG was pleased to be able to be a part of presenting all of this. Uh, I encourage anyone who's interested in the environmental geosciences or practicing in them, if you're not already a member of DEG, by all means, please join us. Um, and thanks again. Thank you, Bert. Great. Okay, um, Galen Hewlin. Um, yeah, I don't really have much to add, but uh, you can reach me at uh, galenhewling at gmail.com or galen at uh, um, grounded energy, grounded minerals, grounded energy.net. Uh, <laughs> That's great. Well, just on LinkedIn. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah, I think LinkedIn is a really good good yeah. tool. And and uh, finally, Galen Dillon. No, oh, thank you for having me. Uh, you know, I was honored to be asked to talk on a little bit of this. I think it's a fascinating study of things that can be done with these waste streams that we're forming out of oil and gas wells, mm -hmm. and potentially being able to repurpose some wells mm -hmm. and uh, continue the life cycle of these things. I think. Uh, a lot more work needs to be done to look not just at the smack over, but well outside of it and uh, be interested to see where it goes in the next couple of years. So thank you. Great, great final words. And again, everyone, you'll be receiving an email from me with a link to the recording and announcement for our next AAPG Academy. I would think next week we're doing CCUS. So that will be a lot of fun and the outlook on that. And thanks again. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye.